Amen. All right. You guys may be seated. Thank you, worship team. All right. Good morning, church. Welcome. Hope you guys got some rest because, you know, church started at, at 11. So, um, and now ready to take in God's word. Today we're actually going to read from James. Uh, we are in the study of James. It's a new sermon series. We started just last week. Uh, so if you are new with us, welcome. We hope to see you here again. This is just the beginning, and we have a lot more to dig into. And if you are coming back with us and just missed last week, then no worries, because we are transitioning into the book of James from the book of Acts. And actually, where we stopped our study of Acts is a perfect place to transition into James, because the book of James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, and most likely it was written right around that period of chapter 11 of Acts, during the time that the church was experiencing persecution, during the time where the church wasn't even preaching to the Gentiles yet, most likely in a time when most of the Christian believers or all Christian believers were just Jews who were dispersed through Israel and beyond. And the reason they were dispersed is because they were experiencing many trials. The early church started experiencing a famine that was actually um, prophesied about earlier in Acts. The early church began to experience persecution from different uh, other Israelites, from other Jews, from the Romans. They started being killed, martyred. We actually see... Stephen, the first martyr in the book of Acts, get killed. And that's when we hear that the Israelites and the Christian Israelites, they began to disperse. They began to go abroad. They began to hide. They began to go other cities, other places. Yet they carried the gospel with uh, wherever they went. And here James writes a letter. James was a pastor in the church in Jerusalem. He was the leader there. He was a very well-known leader in the early church, and he takes over, and as he writes the book of James, he writes to the early church full of believers, mature believers who knew the Old Testament, right, because they were Israelites, they were coming from a background of knowing the scriptures, and also to Israelites who were Christians. They knew the teachings that Jesus came and brought, they knew the teachings that Jesus taught, and so they are very mature believers in their knowledge. And he is writing to them not to just teach them theology, more of it, to tell them more of the things they need to know, the things that they need to study. But instead, like many of us here, he, they, he, they already know what they need to know about theology, and he is simply challenging them to live out their knowledge. And he's, in a sense, telling them, listen, you guys are mature believers. You guys know everything there is to know from the Old Testament. You guys already know the teachings that Jesus brought us. And here I'm going to challenge you and remind you of the fact that it's not just about calling yourself a believer and calling yourself a Christian, but it is about walking that walk in every single day and every walk of life. It's not about just going and telling yourself, pronouncing your faith. It's not about just op cracking open the scripture and reading it. In our context, it's not about just posting something on Instagram that has to do with Jesus. It's not about just saying that you're a believer because nowadays everybody in the United States is a Christian and a believer. But it's about walking according to the gospel. It's about walking according to the commandments of God. And as we're going to open up to James chapter 1, to get ready to see what exactly James calls of us, I just wanted to quickly remind us that in chapter 1, James begins with talking about perseverance. He introduces a topic of trials that the church was experiencing. Again, there was a famine in the land. There was a big division between the poor and the rich because the poor were hungry. The rich were taking advantage of them. There was a division between different believers. There was, um, there was division going on in regards to who they viewed as better than others. Uh, people were being ignored, the widows, the orphans, those who were oppressed. Um, and on top of all of that, 
Christians weren't responding in the way that they were meant to respond. And so James challenges them to remember the gospel. He challenges them to walk in perseverance despite the many trials that they may face. And he calls them to ask God for wisdom. So that not only they may know the gospel, but in wisdom they may walk out in it. And as we crack open the book of James, I just want us to also uh, take a quick look at John chapter 15. And you guys don't have to open up to it, but follow along as I read. Just listen carefully. And the reason I want us to go quickly jump back to John 15 is not because there, needs to be, there is a direct connection, but because a lot of James is based on the previous teachings of Jesus. And I would actually encourage you when you go home today... Crack open the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached with the book of James and just look at how parallel they are. At times it seems that James is almost quoting Jesus word for word. And in, although John chapter 15 is not Mount, uh, Mount, or Sermon on the Mount, uh, it is the teachings of Jesus right before he passed away, right before he went and died on the cross. And through the book of James, we know that the early church was already aware of Jesus' teachings, that apostles were teaching it, and that they were very well aware of this teaching, the teaching of faith. And that's something very important for us to look into because we can't just take the book of James out of context. It will be very similar to what my friend Emic and my wife Vika do when they watch TV shows. Skip through half of the season and just get to the interesting part. And then they get all confused about what's going on, right? So in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and this is Jesus speaking. And my, fa- my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So already he addresses his disciples. That's who he's speaking to. This is a bit before Jesus gets taken to die on the cross. And he reminds them of the fact that, listen, you are to bear fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. And the Father, he matures you, he helps you grow in your faith That way you may bear more fruit, but don't forget a very important part. You are already cleansed. Meaning, you have faith in me, you are already a Christian, you are already saved. He is speaking to believers here. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches." Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Remember James chapter 1 where He addresses us and challenges us to ask the Father for wisdom. But that by this my Father may be glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that somebody lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. 
So this is a, mass, a message that Jesus is preaching to his disciples, reminding them of the fact that, look, aside from me, you are nothing. Aside from me, you can do nothing, and you need the gospel of God. You need faith to be saved, and my word, the gospel that I came preaching to you, does that. It gives you salvation. It gives you freedom from sin. It gives you eternal life, but that's not where your walk ends. Jesus tells his disciples that we are cleansed by the word of God, we are called to abide in Christ and love him, and we are to do that, and while doing that, we are to bear fruit and obey God's commandments. And in that, our love for God is shown, and it is when in trials and the difficulties, we show our love to him by obeying his commands. And we are to do these things in love for one another And with full trust in God, knowing that whatever we ask of him will be answered. Again, this is an important passage for us to read. Not because it directly goes into James, but because James preaches a similar message, but a slightly more focus on the way that the Christian walk should look like. A lot of times people open the book of James and think, take it out of context and believe that he is preaching a salvation by works, but that's not what he is doing. Instead, he is just str- stressing the importance of our walk as Christians to walk in obedience to God. And he does that in the knowledge that those Christians that he is speaking to are already well aware of the fact that it is faith that saves them. It is faith that saves them, but it does not stop at that. They must walk according to the will of God. And so as we open up to James chapter 1, we will start with verse 18, where where James slightly reminds us of the gospel. He doesn't completely brush it off. He doesn't completely forget it. He doesn't ignore the gospel, but he gives us a very small verse, a glimpse into what the gospel is, and then in verses 19 through 27, which is what we will look into a little bit deeper, is where he tells us how we are to accept the gospel of God and how it challenges us to walk in it on a daily basis. And so in verse 18, here's what James tells us. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of the truth, the word of the truth being the gospel, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So here, quickly, James reminds us, he talks about perseverance through trials, through difficulty, and he reminds us of the gospel. He reminds us that, look, despite all these trials that you may go through, despite the perseverance that you have to withstand, remember that it is by the gospel that you are brought forth, you are called by me, so that you may be my firstborns, my firstfruits of my creation in eternity. And he basically tells them that, look, Fellow Christians, fellow believers, you are going to be with Christ in eternity. You are going to be his first fruit for his firstborn creation that is going to be with him in the heavens, in heavenly realm. But to do that, it doesn't just stop at calling yourself a believer. It goes beyond that. We are not to just call ourselves Christians, but accepting the word of the truth, accepting the gospel, we must live it out. And ultimately, that's the question that I want each and every one of us today to ask ourselves. Do I live out the gospel of Christ? Am I just like these Christians here in the book of James that calls themselves a Christian, but doesn't know how to truly respond to this gospel? Or am I a believer that reads the scriptures, that studies them, that understands And that lets the word penetrate my heart and challenges my everyday walk. Because these Christians here, they face these trials. And believe it or not, a lot of them didn't respond in the way that Christians are called to respond. In fact, history shows us that it is very possible that a lot of these Christians stood up in rebellion. It tells us also that there were Israelites who were zealots. There were Christians who were also likely zealots to stand up against the Roman rule, to stand up against those who were rich. 
not just to preach the gospel to them and to show them that there is no partiality between them and those who are higher status, but to go on and to quarrel with them, to argue with them, to kill others. It was full of violence. And a lot of times as we read the book of Acts, we don't see that. But the further we're going to dig into it, we are going to see what a violent, what an angry place it was, even in the church, where when Gentiles begin to accept Christ, they are being hated by other Christian believers, by the Christian Jews, for not being Jewish. And then there is talk of anger, talk of hate. There is action that shows that as well. Christians didn't know how to respond, even though the gospel was in front of them, even though they had all of Old Testament, even though Jesus preached love and talked so much about accepting others and talked so much about truth, Christians still didn't know how to respond. And so here we get to verses 19 through 27, where James, in, the, in his letter, to the early church, begins to write and teach about the practical ways of implementing the Scripture into our lives. And in verses 19 through 21 is where he begins, and he begins with a very interesting topic, topic that was very convicting for me. And here's what he says. Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, And slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And receive with meekness the implanted word that is the gospel. Which is able to save your souls. So here James gets very practical, very clear, very straight to the face. And honestly, just as you read it, is exactly what it says. Be slow to speak, be slow to anger, but be quick to hear. The Christians within the church were very quick to express their emotions, which is okay. It's okay to show your emotions, but God calls us to do it with thoughtfulness. He calls us not to be angry and act out of anger. We are called Not just to watch our words, but we are called to be quick to hear. We shouldn't speak without control. We shouldn't speak without thought. And we shouldn't speak out of anger. And it's very easily said for us, right? When you hear that, you're like, man, that's so easy. That's obvious. I mean, come on. Like, duh. Of course you should think before you speak. I was taught that since I was four or five years old. But it's much more difficult to do when you're in that moment of somebody in your face telling you how worthless you are, right? The first thought that comes to your mind is that you need to be slow to speak. Or when you are being persecuted for your faith, what is our first reaction? Is it often to just slow down and think and soak in? the environment that is around us, to think about the way that we are going to respond, to think in, to respond in a way that is going to reflect the gospel best. It's much easier said than done. And yet, it is very important to watch what comes out of our mouth. And the reason James says that and stresses that is because Even when you read the book of Proverbs, you begin to realize that Israelites had a strong belief that words were often the first thing to tell you about somebody's character. Very often, the words that come out of our mouths, the things that we speak, are the first thing, the first impression to show us and to shine a light into who we are, into our character. The way we carry ourselves, the way we speak to others, the way we treat others, whether or not we talk behind their back, tells, uh, says a lot about our character and our view of God. 
And James is going to stress the tongue a lot more later on. But the basic idea, the very shallow idea, the very beginning and intro of what he's trying to say is that, look, the word of God, the gospel that is being preached to us should be accepted with humility. And the very first place that it should begin to affect, the very first thing is our speech. And it is the way that we carry ourselves and carry the words that we take with us. And later on, we're going to see him even mention that with, one, with your mouth, you both bless and curse God. And that's not okay. Because we are to speak with the righteousness. We are to speak in a way, as verse 20 says, that is going to produce righteousness of God or bring God glory. Ultimately, he is challenging us to speak in a way that is going to bring God glory. And then he goes into verses 22 through 25. And here, James takes a shift from not just speaking. He challenges us as Christians. He tells us that it's not about just the way you talk, right? That's just the beginning. But it's about the way you do your life. It's about the way you live. That's what being a Christian is about. It's not just about you telling you're a Christian. It's not just about fixing your speech. But it's about the way you do your everyday life. He goes on to tell us, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It's very easy to call yourself a Christian. It's very easy to come here and sit in these chairs, be part of a church, It's very easy to go to a community group and study God's word, but it's much more difficult to do God's word. And just think about what he says. Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Don't lie to yourself thinking that you are a Christian and yet ignore the commands that God gives you. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. And then when he looks at himself and goes away, he forgets what he looked like. Imagine looking at yourself in the mirror, turning around and forgetting who you are. Completely forgetting your identity. Calling yourself a Christian But not living with it is denying your identity and who you are. It's not living according to the identity of Christ. It's not living according to the word that God calls you to. It's not living according to the claim that you make. We often claim to be Christians, but we don't carry ourselves that way. We don't live like it. We don't walk it out, especially in the difficulty. Again, Paul, James stresses the importance of doing all of these things, of living out the gospel and living out God's commands in moments of trial and persecution and difficulty. He's not just talking about it in the times of comfort. He's not looking at us and he's not telling us, look, be a good Christian, you know, when others treat you well, treat them good, you know. Be a good person. That's all it takes. No, he's telling them when somebody spits in your face, when somebody is running after you, wanting to stone you and kill you, when you are being hated for what you believe in, you are to accept the word of God and you are to live according to the gospel. Despite the various trials that you face, ask for wisdom and it will be granted to you and live according to it. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, the one who lives out the word of God, not being a hearer only who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Live. God is calling us to live in the gospel that he gives us. Just think back to John chapter 15 where Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, Look, you, if you are a Christian, you call yourself my disciple? Well, I am the vine and you are the branches. And you are to bear fruit that I bear in your life. 
You're not just to call yourself a believer. You're not just to say that you have the gospel in your life and turn around and live as you please. You're not to go back to Moses' law after I die. Once I die, you're not to go back to the old vine dresser. No, you are to live in me. You are to live according to the new gospel. You are to live according to the word that I give you. And you are to walk in the way that I have set for you. Be doers and not hearers only. And two things we take away from this. And one is that we are simply to live according to the gospel of God. Our faith and love for God must come with faithfulness and obedience to his commandments. Just as Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. But the second thing that I want us to also stress, and very important not to forget, is that our works aside from Christ are dead works. And why do I want to mention that? Is because for those of you who maybe do live according to the word of God or think that you do, it's very important to remember and point out that without faith and your trust, full trust in Jesus, your works are also empty. There's a connection here that James wants to remind us of. There's a connection between these two that Jesus preaches. That you trust in me, I am your vine, you are my branches. As you grow in me, as you trust in my gospel, as your faith grows in me, you are to persevere and walk in Christ. You are to walk in me and you are to bear fruit according to my word. And what does that look like? I love the way James writes this passage here, the way he writes verses 18 through 27, because he introduces the gospel to us, he reminds us of it, he tells us what we need to do, gives us two principles, right? He tells us, look, make sure that you are careful with your speech, most importantly, be slow to speak, be quick to hear, don't burst out with anger when somebody persecutes you when you face trials don't burst out in anger but live according to faithfulness and don't just listen to the word that i tell you but do it live out the gospel and you know you hear that and you're like okay yeah you're right i must live out the gospel but what does that really look like on a practical level What does living out the gospel look like in my everyday life? And that is what James is going to talk about in these last two verses. And in verses 26 to 27, he is going to give us a very small intro to what an everyday life of a Christian looks like. Throughout the rest of the book, he's going to dig deeper into the details of living according to the word of God, on loving others, what it really looks like. He is going to dig deeper into what it means to control your tongue and to be separate from the world. But here in verses 26 and 27, he gives us a very small glimpse, but a very important glimpse. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not control his tongue, but deceives his heart, and again, what does deceiving your, your heart look like? Not living according to the word of God, right? Verses 22 through 25, he tells us, if you do not live according to the word of God, you're deceiving yourselves. So he tells us, if you do not control your tongue and deceive yourselves, meaning don't live according to the word of God, your religion is worthless. You call yourself a Christian, but you don't control your tongue. You call yourself a believer, but your life aligns nothing with the scripture. Your religion is worthless. Your faith bears no weight. This faith that you say you live by, it holds no foundation, no solid ground. Where is this faith you speak of, but you don't actually walk in it? You don't actually live it out? This religion is worthless. But religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. 
to keep oneself unstained from the world. He gives us two things. To love our neighbor, and not just a regular neighbor, not just your friend that is doing well, right? But to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction. To visit believers, and not just believers, but to visit people who are in difficulty in various trials, to show them love, and in addition to that, to keep oneself unstained from the world. It means loving our neighbor even, when the least of, uh, even to the least of them because Christ first loved us. It means loving the widow, loving the orphan, showing love to the oppressed in their affliction. And we see that James preached clearly and a lot more in detail later on. It means standing by the ones who are broken and being hurt. Think of a widow that just lost her husband. Think of an orphan who just lost their parents or grew up without them. Think about the parents that lost their children. And and even on a topic that is often so touchy for us Christians, a mother that aborted her child. Or a woman at the well that lives in adultery. That Jesus doesn't just push away, but he preaches the gospel into her life. Think about the family whose kid just got gunned down in the street and is full of brokenness. The people who are afflicted show love to them. Pure and undefiled religion is that you visit those people, that you show love to them, that you preach the gospel to them. He doesn't call us to sit there and tell them in their face what was done wrong in their life. He doesn't tell us to go to that person to just preach them about the sinful nature that they have and about the sin that is so loud in their lives and how they defile every message and the gospel that Jesus came to die for. No, he tells us to be with those people and to visit them in their affliction. It doesn't mean that we ignore sin, but it does mean that we show love and affection and care to the people who are most in need in their deepest need for the gospel. Check out what, look at what Amos chapter 2 verses 6 through 7 says. God speaks to Israelites in Amos chapter 2. And he speaks to this prophet, and he tells them that this is what I'm going to judge Israel by. From these things, I will not relent my judgment. This is what the Lord says. For there are three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver, the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground, and they deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. Completely disregard those who are in need. Those who are poor and those who are in need of the gospel. Those who need to see the love and the the sacrifice of Christ most. Those are being ignored. And yet we are called to live according to the gospel of God. And so often, it's not even that we don't go out there and live a sinful nature of life. Oftentimes, all it takes is for us to get our comfortable seat in church and to just stay rooted where we are. But that's not what Christ calls us to. He doesn't call you to be seated in your chair in your church and to just hear the gospel and to know what it is. He doesn't just call us to be part of worship team and to just set up for the church service. He calls us to get our hands dirty and to live with gospel in everyday lives around people who need to hear it. And the truth is this. The truth is that at some point in our lives, we will all be in that affliction. The truth is that someday you're going to be under various trials, just like these widows and orphans that he is speaking here about, or just like the church that he is speaking to. 
And just like the church in Jerusalem that couldn't escape their trials, that couldn't escape their persecution, there will be times where we feel like all these various trials are crushing us and we can't bear to, wear, to carry the weight. There will be times when we will fail and it will feel like we are not living according to the word of the gospel that Christ calls us to. Each and every one of us will be in those shoes one day. If we're not in those shoes now. We will be people that just can't seem to get our act together. We will be people that just keep either screwing up or we feel like our whole life is in ruins because of the trials and the circumstances that we are facing. But the beauty of the gospel is this. And I'd like us to turn to John chapter 21. Remember how in John 15, Jesus calls to his disciples to live out the gospel? Tells them that, listen, you must live according to the word of God. Otherwise, if you do not bear fruit, you will be thrown out. He is speaking to his 12 disciples before he dies on the cross. One of those disciples being Peter who moments later actually denies Jesus three times and betrays him. And yet in John chapter 21, after all of that, in verses 15 through 19, after his resurrection, Jesus is speaking to Peter, a man who is still under, in a sense, a trial, who cannot forgive himself and cannot believe that he betrayed the one man, he betrayed Jesus, The one person whom he told he was never going to leave his side. I will go to death if that's what it takes, Jesus. And here's what Jesus tells him. Jesus didn't yell at him. Jesus didn't scorn him. Jesus didn't tell him about how terrible his sin was. But instead, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, Son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. You see, the truth of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, and he calls us to live out the gospel. And he calls us not to be just hearers, but doers of it as well, in the most difficult times and difficult trials. We are not called to just sit around and just do our lives the way we're used to doing it, to in the comfort of our homes and just to preach the gospel to our kids and to go to church on Sundays and go to community groups once a week and to just stop at that. We are to get our hands dirty and to fight for lives that Christ calls us to. We are to live out the gospel even when we are being persecuted, but at the same time remember that even in the moments that we fail, that does not mean that you are lost and you are beyond God's reach and that you have lost your salvation. But no, Even Peter, the man who betrayed Jesus himself, was given a chance again and again. And that wasn't the last time that he messed up and strayed away, in a sense, from the gospel. 
But yet Jesus calls him to follow me. And we know what a great and wonderful apostle Peter became later on. A man that truly lived out the gospel of God. And in so, let us allow the gospel to sink in. May we accept it with humility, with meekness that God gives us. And as we do that, live it out in everyday lives. Not just in the comfort of our homes, but around the people that truly need it. Let us finish in prayer. Father, I thank you for this morning, Jesus, that you have given us a letter by your half-brother, James, Lord. James, the, a man that also introduces himself as a slave for the gospel, as your slave, God. And I just ask you and beg you that we may live our lives in such a way that we may be able to call ourselves slaves of the gospel as well. Lord, give us courage and give us power to ask you for wisdom when we need your wisdom to overcome the various trials and temptations that may enter our lives. Lord, that even in the most difficult situations, we may not stray away from you, God, but that our speech may reflect you, that our speech may glorify you, and that our actions may reflect your word. That in all things we may not forget those who are oppressed and are in the deepest need of you. But God, we may, that we may search for people who need to hear the gospel. That we may be there for the people who need you most. Amen.